So this week we are talking about objects. Well, we're talking about object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is really a series of principles that um, you use to encapsulate a lot of things. Um, and previously, we've been able to, you know, we've, we've created code block in functions and in if statements and in loops. Um, and, and that's all great. But we're going to put together this week functions and variables, and we're going to name them and pass them around. And we're going to learn how to do things like create an equal, a function where you can take uh, two objects of the same class and determine if they're the same. And we're going to create those. So there's a lot of stuff that we've already done that can be used in a, a class. And there's some new stuff we're going to learn. So, so we have some new keywords and some new functions. So the first word we're going to learn is class. Class is how you define what an object will be. So a class is not an object. A class is like a blueprint. Okay. You can have a blueprint for a house or a blueprint for a car, but you can't sit in the blueprint and drive it anywhere. The car is the thing that you can drive. The blueprint is just something that tells someone how to build the car. So class is how we define what it is we want to build when we're creating an object. So you can think of class as a blueprint, an object is the thing, like the blueprints for a car and the fact that you can get in a car and drive. So that's kind of a visual picture on what a class is. You have a class, and that's what you create an object from. Very few people I know can go out there and just pick a bunch of parts together and build a car. So. Somebody has to go out, get the stuff that they need. For me, I'd have to hire a team of mechanics. Um, the, that's what the constructor, which is the underscore, underscore, knit, underscore, underscore, self. And yes, those are two different underscores. Um, that's what the init function does. That's what the constructor does. It goes out and it gathers all the things it's going to need to create an object of whatever the class is that we're using. Self is used in a class to denote the object instantiation. So there's what is, and, and it's, it has to do with memory space. So we'll talk about this a little more. So we'll go in and talk about this a little more in just a second. An object is an instantiation of a class. An object is a car classes the blueprints to make a car. Okay, so some basic concepts of object-oriented object programming, and these are more, more than just Python. These are all object-oriented programming languages, or most languages that have the ability to create um, objects. So data abstraction, what are we doing? We are hiding the code from those who are using the class. Somebody should not have to know what's happening within that class, okay? I don't know a lot about the engine, a lot less than I used to when I was a teenager. When I get in to drive a car, I get in to drive my car, and I expect that when I turn the key, my car is going to run. So they, I know that it has an engine. I understand what an engine does but I couldn't get in there and take a wrench and do anything to that engine. So that's kind of the difference between implementation and abstraction. The implementation is somebody went in there and they built that engine and they stuck it in the car and they know where the spark plugs go, where all the wires go. Um, and then there's the abstraction of, yeah, it's an engine. I know it's an engine. I know I have to have an engine in my car. That's the difference in depth. Somebody's 
knows that engine inside out, and somebody like me who just wants it to work when you turn the car on. Inheritance. I can take all of the stuff that I have defined in my blueprint and use it in something else and add on to it. So maybe I have a blueprint for a car. It's a generic car. It's got four wheels. It's got a couple of doors. It's got that engine I was talking about. But maybe I want a different kind of engine. Maybe in my car, you know, it's got the standard four-cylinder, don't go really fast, don't go too slow engine. And maybe in my neighbors who loves to drive, it's got a V8, you know, one of the, I think of those old Mustangs with the big V8 engines. So that would be inheritance. We have a class defining a car, and then we have, we get all of that stuff for the car, and then we can have middle age mom vehicle for me or race car for a neighbor. Um, polymorphism. You can access different object, objects of different types through the same interface. So what that basically does is it says, I have defined a set of function calls that sit within my class. And when I inherit, when I use the inheritance principle, I can actually have different things happen in a function of the same name. So polymorphism and inheritance are meant to work hand in hand. And we won't get into that depth in this class, but I wanted to introduce you guys to the concept and the terminology. Okay. Why do I like object-oriented programming? Short, sure, my favorite thing in programming is reusability. Instead of just reusing a function because we can call it by name, we can now reuse the function and variables and special operators and all kinds of things. So instead of just naming a group of code, we're now naming a big collection of stuff, including functions, uh, and that's a plural, because you can define lots of functions in a class. So let us talk about what the building blocks of a class are. So just to remind you, the class is the blueprint to the car. It's not, I cannot sit in the blueprint and drive away anywhere. So what we're building here is a blueprint for what we actually want to happen in the computer. So the class is a definition. The definition has a name, just like you can name a function, you can name a class. And inside of it, it's going to have things that can hold data, i.e. variables. And it's going to have functions. So it could have one, but it could also have a lot more. So um, a class, the important thing to remember about a class at this stage is a class is a definition only. A class does not exist in your running script in anything other than a definition until you tell it to. And just like, you know, when we defined our functions and I showed on the debugger that Python doesn't attempt to execute the function until it's called, the same with a class. But in class, instead of being called, it's instantiated. Um, and so that's just the example of the blueprint, and this one's the house. So let's talk about an object. So we have our blueprint called a class. The class has some name, it's got some functions, it's got some variables, and I can create as many of instances of that class as I want, or mostly as I need, just like you know, middle-aged mom car and race car are two instances of that car blueprint, we can abstract that and say, I can create an object, as many objects as I need, based on the blueprint of the class that I've defined. An object is available in the running script, so you can get to the variables. The variables actually store data. You can execute the functions. We're going to learn the notation on how to do that. Um, and you can have as many 
objects as you need created from a single class. That's the beauty of a class. So let's talk about the mechanisms. First we have the keyword class. Class is, uh, it, it tells Python anything after this until we go all the way left justified again is in the class. The next thing is the name. You have to give it a name. In this class, the name is just time. And as with everything like this, we have to end it with a colon. If we forget that colon, Python will not be nice to us. So I have def there. Def defines a function. Just like you would define a function outside of a class, you define a function inside of a class. This is a special function, and you know it's a special function in Python because it starts with two underscores, the name, and then two underscores. So underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore is the special function name for a constructor. Every class has to have a constructor because we have to know where to start. Um, it also allows us to define an initial state. So an initial state is just how do you want that car to start? How do you want, you know, our, you know, is it going to have four seats or is it going to have two? I could have number of seats as a variable. And then it would tell me I was going to have two seats or four seats. Um, so this is just the basic mechanics of a class. You always have to have the keyword class. After the keyword class, you have to have a name. That name follows the same naming convention as everything else in Python. There's nothing new or different. you got to have that pesky colon. And you have to have an init method for that class. And that init method has to take a single argument, at, at least one single argument, and that argument is self. Self is a very special word in classes, and it gives an object its identity. Otherwise, it has an identity crisis. Um, so yes, self. It's a special keyword. It represents the object which was created, the class was created, um, was created from the class. And you can think of this as a definition and then actually a space in memory. So self takes you to the place in memory where that object lives. It, it's, it's an address specifier. It's just, it's a pointer to a place in Python memory. And it's still a function. Don't forget the colon. So now I have this dot notation here. Underneath that constructor, the underscore init underscore underscore function, I have self.hour and self.minute. This is called a dot notation. And basically what you're doing is you are giving it the object that object address that you have to have, and then you're saying dot, and then in this case, a variable. Hour is just a variable. We know hour is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. That doesn't change. We know that hour is an instance variable for an object because it has the word self in front of it followed by a dot. So that's what that whole line tells you. Hours a variable, because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. It is an instance variable, which will exist only when the object is created. And I know that because to the left of the word hour is the special word self and a dot. So that is what the dot notation is. And we're going to use that for other things in a little, bit, in a little uh, while. Um, I think this just says instance variable. You always know it's an instance variable if it has self with a dot in front of the variable name, period. There are things that are not instance variables, but for the most part in this class we deal with instance variables. The same thing with minute, okay? Minute's a variable. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. We know it is an instance variable because to the left of that variable name is self dot. Okay. 
So we can assume a class called time. And what we see here is, on the right, we have an hour instance variable and a minute. And this little um, rounded rectangle is something that we use when we're defining classes diagrammatically. But the name of the class is time, and it's got an hour, and it's got a minute instance variable. Okay, an object is an instance of a class. So let's figure out what's going on here. We got our class time. We just talked about our class time. We've got our representation of a class over on the right-hand side. It's called the, class, the representation is time, and it has an hour and a minute. So now, it doesn't exist yet. So how do I make it exist? Well, I make it exist by calling the constructor of the class. So if we read that statement beginning with start time, start underscore time is a variable. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Again, that doesn't change. On the right-hand side, you will see the word time with a capital T open and close parentheses. This tells Python that it's calling the class called time. So instead of just having that class definition floating out there and nice pretty words on your screen, we are now carving out a piece of memory and calling it start time. We are saying start time is going to be the variable that contains all the information of my object. And I'm going to create two variables. So now two variables are actually taking up memory space that start time points to. So that's the init. Here I can now set the hour and the minute. So if you look at the dot notation again, the dot notation outside the class is start underscore time dot hour equal 11. So because start time tells me where the object is in memory, I can use that special dot notation we just talked about to set the variables that are contained inside that object. So I can say start time dot hour equal 11, and hour becomes 11 for start time. I can say stop time, sorry, start time dot minute equal 10, and the minute is going to equal 10. So the actual memory address is changed. So, uh, sorry, the address hasn't changed. The value associated with that memory address has changed. And I can do this as many times as I want. Okay, I have my class time here, and I have my little definition. I'm going to have start time. So now I have an object called start time. I'm going to set my hour and minute for start time. And now I've got a stop time. I'm creating another instance of the same class. And this object is called stop time. And it's the, all the same definitions. I've now carved out a second memory space. Stop time gets me to the stop time memory space. And I can set the hour, and I can set the minute. And it's different than start time because it's actually a different place in memory. I have gone, and I've taken, and I've carved out another place in the computer memory that I'm going to have a class time that's been instantiated. So go off and do a little yes. Oh, I didn't get that. I don't think so. There are only two of us. Yeah, it looks like, oh, who, who else? We have, now have three. We have Jocelyn, Kevin, and Quentin. So is there a question, Kevin? If not, it's good. Cool. So let's go out and do a little bit of programming. So this is my, this is my stopwatch. Okay, that's my bigger stopwatch. 
No, last week, and I'm sorry if people didn't get the email. I sent the email out to everyone. I unfortunately, because of work, could not do the um, the lecture last week. There are previous Module 7 lectures out there, but I could not do it last week. And I was hoping that all of the professors sent out the notice. OK, so time. This is much more complex, and we'll come back to it. And this is also in its own module. And we'll talk about that a little later. But what I've got here is I've got, you can ignore all the rest of this stuff right now. I've got the time. I've got a class called time. And then in this case, I have hours, minutes, and seconds. So let's do simple time. OK, this is not as simple as I wanted. Uh, stopwatch. No, that's way unsimple. Um, OK. So we're just going to stick with simple time. I have my class time. Thank you. Um, I have a class called time. Now in this case, time has a lot of stuff in it. Okay, And we're going to get to what all of these other things are in a little bit. Um, now you'll notice that class, the word class, is left justified. Because as everything is with Python, cases and spaces matter. So this is on the very left hand side of your script. Everything else under class is indented at least one, at least. All these defs are tabbed in one, and everything else is tabbed in more. But you'll also notice that other than that, these, these are pretty much class, just functions. So the next thing that will happen is the next line that is left justified is outside the scope of the class. So we've talked about scope before. We've talked about local scope. And we've talked about global scope. This class definition is in the global scope. Everything inside of this class definition is inside the local scope of the class. And we can have further local scopes. Lines 3 and 4 are in the local scope of the constructor. Lines 15 through 20 are in the local scope of the less than operator. And we'll figure out how to do that in a minute. Line 22 is back in the global scope. So starting at line 22, I am no longer defining my class, but I'm going to use it now. So if I go starting at line 22, I have num tries, num times is 3, and I've got, I just created a list of times. And then I say for range, I in range num times, I'm going to enter the hours and the minutes, and I'm going to split that, and then I'm going to append that to my time. And then I'm going to check whether one time is less, what's the earliest time. And by the way, this is, this is like doing a min, but for a class. So I'm going to run this real quick. Put a breakpoint, simple time. I'm going to debug this, because we all know how much I, I love the debugger. So I stopped at line 22. That's the first place this stopped. I know it stopped in PyCharm, because I have this beautiful blue line there, which means not lines 1 through lines 20 were read in, but they weren't executed because there's nothing to execute right now. The only thing we have from the first line through line 20 is a bunch of words. They do not take up space in the running program. But I want them to, because I want to have times, and I want to use those times to um, to determine what the, the shortest time was. Let's say I'm in a race. So I've just got num times 
is 3. So I'm going to go through the loop starting at 26, and I'm going to create a time. So first, I'm going to enter time, which is hours and minutes. So I look at the console, so my hour is 10 and my minutes are 11. So I'm going to do my split. We all know what split is, and I'm going to append time, times.append. So here's my times list. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to append a time object. So we haven't talked about this yet, so I'm sorry I don't have a simpler example. But basically what we're doing here is we're calling time with values. So if I step into this, I end up in the constructor. I end up all the way back up at the top into the constructor. And basically I'm going to set hours and I'm going to set minutes. And then I'm all the way back out again because it's all I had to do in the class and inside that class. And if I look here under variables, you will see I have I, I have num times, and I have this list of times. Oh, I haven't finished appending. That list of times gets appended to with a time object. So if you see this, I have one element, and it is a time object. So I have created a single object. So if I run through this again, hold on, two, three, I'm just going to continue. I'm going to do three, four. Whoops. Enter. OK. So now I'm going to check on the minimum time. So if we go back here and we look at frames and variables, we see there are three times. Now I know it's a time object, partly because Python is telling me right here in between these little squiggly braces. 0, 1, and 2 are time objects. So that means that identically they are like this time class, except for the hours and the minutes that I've set. Each one of them keeps a different hours and minutes. And I can see that by going down here in PyCharm and seeing that the time object at index 0 of my list is 10 and 11. The time object at index 1 is has hours 2 and 3, and the time object at index 2 has hours of 3 and minutes of 4. So they're all the same, they're all from the same class, but they have different values. And you can do different things with them, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Or actually, we'll, yeah, in a couple minutes. So now I'm just going to go and I'm going to say, if t less than min time, and we're, I'm, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves, and I'll go back and explain what that is, and then we're going to get the lowest time. But that's how the class works. What I was really trying to show you there was the difference. Even though it's a time object, those two variables carry different values. So that's what makes the object unique, and the fact that it's in a different memory space. Um, so let's go back and um, so we can do, as we saw in that example real quick, we can have a constructor with and without arguments. So without arguments, you'll have time and you're going to, de the definition is close to the same, the def statement for init without arguments to the constructor, because remember, a constructor is just a function just has self. Always have to have self. Every function that is part, well, for us, every function is going to have the word self in it in a class. It's always the first argument, and it's a silent argument. So you never, you will never populate self. Python populates that. But I can also pass arguments to the constructor. So the arguments to the constructor, in this case, are hours and minutes. And there's a difference. So if I go self.hour equal zero for the one without arguments, I can say self.hour equal hour for the one with. So the hour on the left-hand side is a variable. The hour on the right-hand side is an argument that came through init, and we're just sending 
setting self.hour to the value that is contained in hour that is the argument. And then the same thing, so far I'm line for line. However, things are going to change. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to create a start time, and that's going to be a time class or an object of type time. On the right-hand side, I'm doing a start time. And I'm having time, but I'm passing my two arguments. So I can do start time equal hour, start time dot hour equal 11, start time of minute equal 11, but I don't have to do anything else on the, uh, on the constructor with arguments. So you end up producing the lines of code. And when you have a lot of complex classes, this is a good thing. You want to reduce the complexity and then reduce the lines of code that you end up writing. So, so, but there's more. <laughs> Instance methods. You can create your own functions, okay? And it is the first function that's in a class. But I can create other functions. I can create a print time. And that print time can have this nice little format statement in it. And it can use the instance variables self.hour and self.minute. And my new time class will, if we look on the, you know, at the blue bubble to the right, it's still named time. We have an instance variable named hour, an instance variable named minute. We have the constructor. And we now have an instance function called print time. Now you'll notice. The only thing that makes it an instance function in this class is the fact that it takes self as an argument. It's the first argument. Um, so I can, de I can define my own functions uh, however I want them to be defined. And the, function, the instance methods that I define are just like functions. They have the word keyword def. They're going to have the name print time. They're going to have self. They have to have self. Um, and they have to, of course, have our pesky friend, the colon. So yes, and the self that comes in, in the, as the argument for the instance method is going to allow us to get to the self.hour and self.minute that are already stored in the memory space of the object. Because remember, as we just saw, I can have three instances of time. I can have as many instances as I want. But our previous example was I had three instances of time. They each had different hour and minute combinations. And I want to make sure I'm getting the right hour and minute combination. And the way I do that is to use self. Because self says it will be the start, it will be the hour and minute based on the object that was created. How do I call an instance method? Well, I use my dot notation. So I have my start time. I create a start time. I've got a stop time. I'm creating a stop time object. Now I'm going to say print time. So you will notice that I said start underscore time dot print time, open and close parenthesis. This is where it can get a little tricky. Um, print time is an instance method, and we know that from the class definition. But when I call it, I don't give it any arguments. The reason I don't give it any arguments is because the only thing this was defined to take is self. And so I don't have to pass it again. Self is silent. You don't have to explicitly do anything. It is there specifically for Python's use. But you have to have it there. So I, I, I think that this causes a disconnect with some students when it comes to object-oriented programming. Um, because we're not used to Python telling us to ignore something. But Python tells us to ignore self. Just make sure it's there, and everything will be OK. 
So since I called print time from start time, I said start underscore time dot print, I am getting the values from my start time object. And I'm getting the minute. And it's going to print time colon 1111. Now, if I want to do the same thing for stop time, I'm going to call print time. Print time is going to get the values from stop time this time because that's the object we called it on. And I'm going to have an hour and a minute. It's going to be time 2 colon 3. So that's how you deal with an instance method. And you always kind of have to think, where's this coming from? What object called it to get me here? Okay. So this is one of the really nice things about Python. It allows you to create your own operators. Operator being double equal sign, less than or equal, less than, greater than, stir. All of those things can be created so that you can use double equal sign when you're checking the up when you're checking the values of objects that are created from the same class. Um, and this is just the example underscore underscore eq underscore underscore. So that underscore underscore eq underscore underscore is specifically used as a function call to define what the double equal sign does when you're dealing with a class. And now we have to have self and then in the equals always going to have to have the other object. So we can also overload string. So I have class time and we've seen our class time before. Now I'm going to say stir rather than call print time. I'm just going to be able to call stir on this class or equal equal. Oops. I wanted to show something else on this. Sorry about that. Hit the enter key too quick. Okay. So I have called, I've also defined underscore underscore EQ underscore underscore here. So if we look at the underscore underscore stir underscore underscore, it only takes itself. That's because it's only going to use the values associated with the object instantiation that called it. So whatever's to the left of that dot is the object that we're going after. Equal is different. The double equal sign overloading is different. And that's because you need something on the right and the left hand side of that double equal sign because you've got to compare it. So what do we do? We pass in another object. So we have self, comma, and whatever you want to call it. It's just a variable name. It's just an argument name. So I just called it other. So now we can take the individual values associated with start and stop time, let's say, and see if they're the same. Because if our from the instance method, if self.hour, which is an instance, not equal other.hour, which is our other object, or the minutes don't equal, then we return false. Otherwise, we return true. So how do you use like an overloaded stir? So we've got our stir. We've got our equal. So I'm going to create my old friend start time, and it's going to have 11 minutes and 11 hours and 11 minutes. I'm going to create stop time. It's going to have two hours and two minutes. So I've got my two objects, and I'm going to print start time. So I'm going to start time, and those are off, and I apologize. So I'm going to go right to underscore, underscore, stir, underscore, underscore. Because what I want is I want a human readable representation. I don't want those squiggly lines with time and all those weird hexadecimal characters. Um, and because I have defined that special stir operator, I don't have to worry about anything. Python will automatically go out and say, okay, 
start time is of type time. There is an overloaded stir operator or stir function on that class. So when I want to print it out, I'm automatically going to create it. I'm automatically going to convert it, and it's going to print the time the way I want it to. And the same if I do stop time. If I print stop time, it's going to go right back to the class definition. But remember, hour and minute are instance variables, so they come from the object. So now it's going to be self.hour and self.minute. Because it came from stop time, it's going to be 2 and 3. So I'm using the same stir, but I have different values that I'm using it because I created the object. So what is that overloaded double equal sign? So there's all the stuff we've just seen a, a number of times. So I have time 1, comma 1. I have my time 2, comma 3. So I have my start time and my stop time. So now I want to know, does start time, is start time the same as stop time? So I can do this. So I have a start time, object, a start time that's of class time and a stop time of class time because they're both created from the same class, I can in fact say, are they equal? So when I use that double equal operator, Python will automatically go and say, oh, did they overload the double equal sign? Let me go look. Okay, yes, there's an underscore, underscore, eq, underscore, underscore. They've overloaded the operator. So I'm going to automatically do what's in this function. So start time for self.hour and self.minute, and then stop time, which is the other that was passed in, other.hour and other.minute. Now, why do I say other.hour and other.minute here? Because I have to get to the value from the object passed in as the other argument. And we're going to return false because self.hour is not the same as other.hour. Self.hour is going to be 11 because I called it from, I called it with start time on the left hand side of the double equal sign. That's something that I think students have trouble um, the first time they do it, they have trouble getting that connection. So I have a start time and a stop time object. It, when I look at the if statement, it says if start underscore time equal equal stop underscore time. That means self is going to be start underscore time because it is on the left hand side of the double equal sign. That will be self and stop time will be other. And if I reverse them, we would have stop time being self and start time being other. So when you're looking at these overloaded operators, self is always the, the object variable that is on the left of the operator. On the right of the operator will be whatever the other argument is in your underscore, underscore, EQ, underscore, underscore. And they're not. So uh, then I promise we'll go. You can make your own modules. This is great. We've done all kinds of stuff. We've done all kinds of programming. We've built our games. Now, just like I can import file or IO or CSV, I can make my own module. And I can import my own module. I can make a time module. And I can then import that, and I don't have to have, I can just use it again and again and again, because maybe this is something that I want to reuse. Maybe I only think about it for running races, but maybe somebody else has another use for this. And if I create it in a module, and just, it's time.py, um, then I can use it again and again. I don't have to worry about it. All I have to do is say, hey, Python, here's where to go get that module. And in this case, I have not only stir and 
equal, but I have underscore, underscore, NE, underscore, underscore, which is not equal. I could have greater than GT, less than LT. I don't know what the ones are for less than or equal or greater than or equal, but we'll have to look. Um, and I can also, in this case, I define an instance method, method called diff, and it's going to return a time object with a difference just because I could. Okay, so when I use the module that I create, I'm going to, from time, import time. So that means from is a keyword. It's telling me that, hey, Python, expect the name of the module next. So time is the name of my module. Then I'm going to use the import. Import is a keyword that says, Python, read anything associated with this import into the memory space of my running script and make it available. So it's just like you copied and pasted that object, sorry, that class into your Python script. But you didn't. Python is doing it for you under the hood. So your Python script is still your Python script, but Python is going to run as if they're in the same file. And in this case, I am the, the name of the class. So I am from time, from the module name. Module name is time.py. Import, and then I'm giving it something. And in this case, I'm giving it the name of a class, and that class is called time. And I can then just have this. It's considerably less. I don't have that whole big class definition sitting in my script. I have it sitting in a module by name where I can get to it, but it's not cluttering up what I need to do because I don't care about the definition. I have encapsulated time into a class and put it on a shelf so I can use it when I need it. Wouldn't that be nice in real life? Uh, to slow down time once in a while when you want to take a longer nap. Anyway. Um, so it just, it makes code a lot easier to read when you don't have a lot of definitions floating around. So this is what it looks like to use our module. Our module name is time.py and for a module name, you don't use the .py afterwards in the import statement. So. I have the name of my class, which is called time. I'm going to create two instances of time, start and stop time. Um, yeah, that's all I think I wanted to do. So I'm going to go in. Well, how about we do this? We will go through the lab, the, and then I will go in and we will take a quick look at a more comprehensive time example. So I was talking about a car earlier. So we have to define a class, and this class is going to be car. I'm going to define a constructor, and it's going to have three instance variables. It's going to have model year, purchase price, and current value. Um, I need to define a function to calculate the current value, and you're going to take as a parameter the current year. So because this is going to be, whoops, sorry about that. Because this function is going to be an instance function, don't forget the self. Self has to be the first argument. And what's that going to do? It's going to set a deprecation rate. It's going to set the age of the car. It's going to calculate the value of the car using the deprecation rate. And it's going to set the current value of the car. So in this line here, it is setting the instance value for the current value of the car. And then if I want to print it, I'm going to say function print. Uh, you're going to create a function to print the car info. Call it print info, whatever you want. And then you're going to follow what the um, lab says about how you have to format the output. So I'm going to have then a main function. I'm going to ask them to input the year, input the price, input the current year, and I'm going to create a car object. 
and I'm going to then set the model year in the car object, set the purchase price in the car object. I'm going to have it calculate the current value because I can do that on the class. And I'm going to call the function to print the information. So the new stuff here is what's inside this class. You're going to have a calculate function, you're going to have a constructor, a calculate function, and a print function. We've, uh, we've looked at these for the most part in the previous slides. So now I've got a class team. So this is lab 810. I'm going to define a constructor. I'm going to set the team name to an empty string. I'm going to set the team number. Um, set the number of team wins to zero, and then set the number of team losses to zero. And I apologize, my formatting is incorrect on this slide. So let's fix that while I'm thinking about it. This needs to be here. And this needs to be here. Uh, that needs to be there. The rest of it's fine. My apologies. Okay. So now that those are formatted correctly, um, and then I'm going to have get win percentage, which is just going to say the win, the lossage, here's the number of team wins. So I'm going to define a main function. We figured that out. Sorry, how to do that a couple of weeks ago. We're going to create a team object. I'm going to ask for it to input the the, number, the wins, the names, the, the wins, the name, the losses, and then I'm going to set that on the instance object. And then I'm going to set that the win percentage, I'm going to call get win percentage. Now, sorry about that. Get win percentage, and remember get win percentage is an instance method, so don't forget the self. And then I'm going to see if win percentage is greater than or equal to zero. I'm going to output one thing, and if it's not, I'm going to output another. So if we look at this real quick, I'm going to go back and, oops, come on, there we go. I'm going to look at time.py. Time.py is my module. This just has that time class in it. That's all it has. It's not meant to do anything on its own. This is simply storing a definition, and in this case I'm storing it by the name of the class, and I'm making the file name the same as the class. It doesn't have to be, but for my mind that just works easier. And I've got my constructor, I've got my um, method to convert it to a string, I've got a less than method, I've got a greater than method, I've got an equal equal method, and I've got this thing called diff. And all of it's just sitting in here, just waiting to be used. Well, when does it get used? Let's go look at stopwatch. Okay, it gets used in stopwatch. So here, I have from time import time. So what this says Python is, Python, go out and look for a module called time.py. I you know this time doesn't have a .py, but that's what it's going to look for. And then from that, I want you to load in the definition of a class called time. And so in this case, it's going, Python is going to go out and it's going to say, is there time.py where I know I can get to it? The answer is going to be yes, it's right here. So then I want to import a class called time. And in this case, the class is called time. So it's going to make all of this look to Python like it's all sitting in the same script. It's all sitting in the same .py file. But it's not. It's just that Python can use it that way. Uh, related to this course, not directly, but about this chapter. That's fine. Go ahead. I'm going to keep talking.
Um, so now, oh, this isn't the one that I want. Stopwatch. So now I want to do more stuff. And in this case, I'm going to have a stopwatch. I'm going to populate. I got bunches of stuff going on for the race, and I've just created this little populate method. Um, I say who started first, faster in the middle. These are just functions that I created. Who won? I have my main method here, and I'm just loading some stuff in. I've got two competitors. I've got a start, middle, and end. So I can populate the race just because I didn't want to type a lot of stuff in. Okay. And then I can figure out what the middle is. I can do the who started first, who's faster in the middle, who won the race, and I can print all this out based on what's going on in time. So these are just some functions, and this is just kind of how I would write a program, especially if I were testing a class. So let us go in and run this real quick. So I'm going to stopwatch. Stopwatch. And I promise I won't keep you too much longer. So let me just make this a tad bit bigger. So I'm just going to debug this. So you'll see it stops here. Before, when the class was at the top of the file, it didn't stop. That's because I'm telling Python to do something on this line, not just hold something in reserve because I might want to use it later. And so I'm telling Python to go out and make time available. And I'm also importing random because I'm going to use it. And now I've got a def populate race. Not going to do anything, just going to read it in and hold it for later. Another function is going to hold for later. A third function is going to hold for later. A fourth function is going to hold for later. And now I'm actually getting into the main, which, allow, which will say, OK, start. So in this case, I've got competitors, I've got intervals, and I'm going to populate my race. So the only thing I'm doing here is I am creating time, time objects. So if I go through this and I've just I've got two competitors, the tortoise and the hare, and I've got start, middle, and end. So I'm going to go through my competitors, and this is not, nothing we haven't seen before because we've done loops within loops. And um, I've got a dictionary that I'm creating. It's just kind of an intermediate dictionary. So I'm going to say for interval in intervals. So I have start, middle, and end. So I'm just going to create our random dot. I'm just using random to create data. And if you're actually doing a test, this wouldn't be different. If you were doing unit testing when you were programming, this is something like you might do. So now I'm going to, I've got my hour, minute, and second. So now I'm going to create a time object for hour, minute, and second. So if I step into this, you will notice that all of a sudden I'm in the time.py class and I am here in the constructor. And that is because Python is treating time.py like it were inside stopwatch.py. So I'm doing the exact same thing, no different. I'm going to add this interval to my interval dictionary. I'm going to do this again. Go back in. So one more time. Go back in. OK. So now I have everything. And I've got the first competitor. So now I'm going to do, go do this, the next competitor. We'll just make it quick. OK. So now I have my two competitors. I have my tortoise and my hare. So that now I'm returning my race. So I had a race between the tortoise and the hare. I know. It's really original. Um, and somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to start first. Somebody's going to get to the middle place first. And somebody's going to get to the end first. So I'm now back here. I have populated my race. So let's just look 
at what race contains. So variables, I have competitors, I have intervals, and now I have this complex set of objects. I have two objects. I have the tortoise and I have the hare. And on the tortoise, I've got three time objects. Okay? I've got start with a time, middle with a time, and end with a time. And the same thing for hair. I've got start, middle, and end. So I created in that six objects in that one little function so that I can have my race between the tortoise and the hare. So it's a dictionary. So I need to go through the dictionary and I need to get stuff for my tortoise and stuff for my hair. So I'm going to say for key in uh, first start. So let's go see. So I've said key, uh, let's see, if these, okay. So I am checking less than, I'll go back and show you how that happened. Right here. Speedy start competitors of counter less than Stow competitors of counter plus one. So this is what I have here. My apologies for not. I'm, I'm deciding who started first. And what I'm doing is I have a counter for the number of competitors in the race. And then I'm going to go modulo two because I need it to, um, if I, I'm doing every other one. And then I have this variable Stow, which is just uh it's just a utilitarian variable. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to add um, stow of competitor one equals race of competitor two for the interval. And then I'm going to say speedy start of competitors of counter, because my speedy start was created up here. And then I'm going to say, is it, is it less than the one from my competitor, from the second competitor. And if it is, then I'm going to say speedy start equals whatever stow is because I want the earlier start. And then I'm going to return speedy. So who started first? Start first is the hare. I can see that right down here. And then it's going to print it. And it's using the one from the hair because that's who started first. And if I look at console, it was speediest starter was hair with that time. Okay? And so now I'm going to go and I'm going to say who, who was in the middle. So I'm going to call faster in the middle, and I'm going to pass it the competitors in the intervals of one, the first, um, the, yeah, the, the second, sorry, passing it middle. Intervals of one, as we can see in the top, is the um, middle, and I'm passing it all the race times. So I'm going to go through the competitors. And I'm checking, is this pick, is the self um, less than the other? So if the self is less than the other, it returns true. Sorry, if the hours are less than, it returns true. If the hours are the same and the minutes are less, it returns true. If the hours are the same and the minutes are the same and the seconds are, the, are less than, then return true, otherwise return false. So that's what we did here, and we're doing this for all the competitors, and it's going to say faster in the middle, and I did something wrong. Error hair. Hmm. I'll have to go back and look at what that was before I post it. My apologies. Format dot key, middle key. Hmm. Oh, it's because the tortoise was, what am I doing? I'll fix this before I put it up. This is your professor not doing what she should have done, which is testing this thoroughly. But that, what this really is, is it is an example 
of kind of how you're going to use a class. We've gone from the complexity of the game to a different kind of complexity. And we do it at the end of the class partly because it's a lot of new stuff, but also because when you move out into the programming world, you should understand these concepts. So, does anybody have any questions? Um, yes, Kevin, I am a programmer. I have been a programmer for close to 30 years. I started way, way, way back. Um, there was a time in college when I actually did use punch cards. Um, that is my full-time job, and I love it. I've been doing it for almost 30 years because I love it. Actually, I think it's been 30 years. I love it. Today, I was wrapping up a proof of concept. We have to do something for a customer. I'm very fortunate in the company that I work in. They give us time to do things like proof of concepts and prototypes. So I was finishing up a proof of concept because I felt like I could do this. It took me a week, got a proof of concept, writing down the design. We'll pass it off to managers and say, when are we, when are we going to do it? And then I'm going to go off to another proof of concept. And then one or two of these proof of concept will be used in the product. And I get to expand my brain. I get to think. I get to learn things. Some people would, would you know, want to claw their eyes out for that as their profession. I happen to love it and I am very thankful that I've had the career that I have. You can pick my brain, send me an email. Yeah, send me an email whenever you want and I'll be happy to answer your questions, Kevin. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Going once going twice. I hope everyone did a great job. Thanks for coming to these lectures and I hope that your future college programming, whatever they are endeavors, turn out spectacularly. And you're welcome, Jocelyn. So I'm going to stop the recording.